Okay, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. A lot of you know Roxanne and her husband Dave. Roxanne was telling me she grew up in a military family, so she traveled quite a bit. But she says her, she's really from South Texas. Whoa, she's from Texas. Texas. Yes. Anyway, um, it's interesting. She she went to Cary University and worked at Cary University. And while she was there, she lived with Josh's family. So she can probably tell us a lot of the stories. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> but, anyway, but she's not allowed. She's now working with the women of Israel. And she and David have been married 18 years. Whoa. So, yeah. so it's, it's their privilege to have you tonight to be our student for us now. Yes. Isaiah 41, 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Now this is my life first. When I was at Bible College at PBU, uh, Josh's dad was my Jewish customs and culture and my Jewish evangelism professor. And he said, when you're evangelizing, you should have like a, a quick testimony and you should have a, a life first. And he's preferably one from the Old Testament if you're ministering in Jewish ministry. So Isaiah 41, 13 was mine. 
and um, it has such a deep meaning to me at so, at so, on so many levels. And maybe at the end of the, the you know this service here that um, I'm sharing with you, I'll share the history behind that, why that verse is so important to me, if, if we have time. So, on rock, this is a poem. Let's see. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Roxanne Karina Villarreal Lightfoot, and I was born in Asmara, Ethiopia, oh. Africa. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever seen a camel, <laughs> and um, certainly won't be the last. But that there is Gide. Gide was my nanny, and um, she used to carry me. Um, well, there I was walking, but she used to strap me on her back and just walk around and, and do help around the house and help us and take care of me. And she she practically raised me. She spent a lot of time with me. But um, you may not know this, but I am the youngest of eight. I don't know how my mom traveled around the world with eight kids, but she was oh, an amazing woman. <laughs> and uh, she used to tell me stories when we lived in Ethiopia, how we lived down the street from King Haile Selassie. And at the time, uh, she used to tell me stories about how we could hear the lions roaring at night. And he would not have securities um, in his palace. He would actually let the lions roam around the palace as protection. And so um, she would tell me stories about hearing that at night. She would tell me stories about the baboons that used to come and you would, things that you would never do. Because if you threw stones at a baboon, they mimic. And so it would throw stones back at you. <laughs> so avoid the baboons. <laughs> and, um, and always close your window at night because when baboons hear babies cry, they would take them away. So you have to be really careful in Ethiopia. But I got to live in many places, in several places after, after Ethiopia. We were stationed in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, after my father moved from um, Kedmu Station, Ethiopia, to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. We lived there for a few years, and uh, it, that was a, a difficult time for me. We, um, we were there for about three years, and I'm just a little baby. I was like three or four years old, and uh, we had a severe car accident. And so when we left Arizona, <laughs> Way, so we moved to Germany, and it was so exciting. And that's me in Germany. I'm standing in front of a float. This is called the Bachfisch Festival, and my sister was Miss Bachfisch Queen. But it was so exciting to live in Germany, to experience what the world was like over there, overseas. And um, my uh, my dad <laughs> wanted me to try it for the Dodgers, <laughs> the Wards Germany Dodgers, and if you. He was so proud of me when I when I tried out because uh, you know little girls were not allowed to play baseball you know it was just unheard of and so when he took me over to try out I was actually killing it I was hitting that ball out to outfield and stuff and, uh, and he was just like oh yeah that's my daughter in fact one little boy said I quit the team I don't want to play with the girl and so, so uh, the season came around and um, if you don't if you notice here I, I'm actually batting left handed. Oh, the yeah. reason I did so well at tryouts is because I was batting right-handed. <laughs> I'm actually right-handed, but um, that car accident in Arizona left me handicapped, so I had to learn to do everything left-handed. And so, but the season came around, I was trying to bat left-handed, it was terrible. So the kid came back and uh, he was like, she's benched, I'll play. So, but it was, it was good, I was on the, the, the Dodgers. But um, it was there in Germany where my mother introduced me to adventure. And um, it was such a wonderful time to be there because on the Army base, they have what's called the NCO wives, which is not commissioned wives, officer wives. And they would have these trips that they would offer them. And so they would take the wives and take them on these trips to crystal factories, to the home factory, to castles, and just so many things that we were able to tour. So we toured several of the castles in Germany. And it was just me and my mom. And she said, Roxanne, she took me out of school to do these things. And I know this, this David to this day is like, oh my goodness, how could she take you out of school? And she used to say, these are things you will never learn in school. These are things you'll never learn in a classroom. Well, let's go. And so she, we'd hop on the bus and she would take me to these places. And to this day, I still remember the crystal factories, the home factories, the trips down the Rhine River, looking at the scenery and the countryside around me. And um, so that was just a really precious time for me and my mom. 
because my brothers and sisters were in high school. She's not going to take them out of high school. She'd rather travel with me. So I got to spend a lot of time with my mother, and it was a very nurturing time. It was a very wonderful bonding time. And um, But not only that, she not only instilled a sense of adventure in me, but also a sense of God and the love of the Lord. And so we would attend church on base, um, chapel, on, we called it Three to Thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And um, and it just so happens that this chaplain led my oldest brother to the Lord when he was 19 and said, you know what, it's time for you to go to college, go to Bob Jones. <laughs> so, so my brother packed up, went to Bob Jones, my long-haired hippie brother, you know, oyster cult t-shirt with bell bottoms and lamb chops, uh, went to Bob Jones. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was then that I knew that um, something different happened when he came home from Christmas. I opened the door and I, I shut the door. I said, Mom, somebody's here to see you. It was my older brother with clean cut hair and <laughs> a suit and a tie and his briefcase. I didn't even recognize him. But what was interesting was that I did recognize him just because of the outside, but he, his spirit had changed and he was sharing the gospel with us. He was sharing what he was learning at Bible college and um, when he finally went back, my pastor at the chaplain, the chaplain was preaching on, on hell. And I realized, you know what, that's what my brother was talking about, my big brother. And uh, I knew that I didn't want to go to hell, so that was my, my salvation experience. I asked my mom, called the chaplain, he came over and he shared the gospel with me. And um, he led me through the Romans Road, and that's when I accepted Christ as my Savior, when I was six years old. And I understood. There's right and there's wrong. I understood that there was something called eternity. I knew there was a heaven. I knew there was a hell. And I didn't want to go to hell. And, and my little childlike faith, I accepted Christ as my Savior. And, um, but I had to realize that it wasn't the cure for me at that age. I was still young. I was still developing. I still had, my personality was um, being developed. And um, I realized that even though I knew Christ was my Savior, I still had a sin. I had to still deal with sin. I still had to deal with lying. And even though I was just a child, I knew right from wrong. And my personality developed over the years. I mean, was, I was independent, but I was still very insecure. I was obnoxious, and I had a severe, deep-seated sense of abandonment. And um, the reason I felt that was because when I was in Arizona, that car accident I mentioned, I was three years old when um, we were, my mom and I and my sister were driving her to college. And we were driving down the, the they're called switchback mountains. So it's only one road going to drop her off at Cochise. And she, my mom looked at my sister and it looked like she was falling asleep. And these roads, there's no guardrails. It's just a cliff that it's hundreds and hundreds of feet down. And she panicked. And so when she panicked, my mom panicked, she jerked the wheel towards the mountain so we would go up the cliff, hit the mountain, rolled over. I was thrown down, my hand went through the window, and um, I, I lost the use of my right hand. My mom was, her leg was messed up, but my sister had her seatbelt on. <laughs> this is the 70s, <laughs> and so, but it was so bad that they had to bring two ambulances, one from one side of the road, one from the other, because they, we, we had to go two separate ways to two separate hospitals. So I was in this hospital for weeks by myself, a little three-year-old child. And my mom couldn't get to me. My dad couldn't get to me because he was dealing with six other kids. And um, the only one who'd come was my big sister, Debbie, who survived, who was doing, who was okay. Um, and she used to come and visit me and sing to me and play her guitar for me and, until I went to sleep. But my best friend was Sesame Street and the nurse who would come and take my blood to check on me. <laughs> and so this is how I was developing, and these are the struggles that I was dealing with even as a child, and um, that's why I became so obnoxious when I was growing up. <laughs> and, uh, but God knew that he was going to use um, my personality in certain ways in certain areas. And my dad finally retired, and we moved back to Texas. And that's where my parents are from, South Texas, right on the border of Mexico. So if you hear about all these illegals coming through, it's, that's where we are. That's where our family is, right on the Rio Grande Valley. And that's, I'm second generation. My mom and dad are first. In fact, my mom and dad didn't learn English until they were in junior high. But um, it was, uh, so we moved back there. So we moved from 
70 degree weather, beautiful mountains in Germany to 100 degree weather in Texas. <laughs> and I was miserable. I was like, Mom, I want to go home. I want to go home. Germany was my home. That's where I loved Germany. I have so many memories there. But um, life went on. And uh, after my father retired, we moved back. And he lived with um, undiagnosed PTSD from Vietnam. And it manifested a lot. And uh, and so we had a lot of anger in our home. And even though we knew the Lord, there was still sin. And sin is just just the worst. <laughs> and uh, but as I grew up, I was I was really rebellious in my heart. I was a good kid, but I was rebellious in my heart. And uh, so at 14 years old was when I went to a youth conference in Dallas or just outside of Dallas, called Broadway, Texas. And there was this youth rally, and it was a huge youth rally. And what they would do is they would house all the kids and the youth or the families that would come. Um, the, the people who were members of the church would bring them into their homes. And I was only 14 years old. And um, I was just a kid, just a 14-year-old girl. And uh, so we um, we stayed at this family's house. I was there with my and this is this is a, a story that I don't share very often, but I wanted to share it with you guys so you could see where I'm coming from as a child, as a young lady, and uh, how the Lord can change us. And, and um, so what happened was we were staying there, and I was staying with my pastor's daughter and some missionaries, their daughter, Rachel and uh, Cheryl. And uh, I was in another room, they were in one room, and I came into their room, and I asked them, hey, what are you guys doing? And they're saying, Oh, Roxanne, we, uh, we're talking about you. And I said, okay, what did you guys say? Is it good back? They said, Roxanne, this is, this is hard to, to share. Roxanne, we are afraid to go to sleep tonight because we don't know if you will stab us in the middle of the night. You would kill us in the middle of the night. And I, that's, I thought to myself, I wasn't even angry with them for talking about me or even thinking about or saying this to me. I was, I was so heartbroken that um, even though I was really obnoxious and annoying growing up, I never thought that somebody would ever think that I was capable of doing something like that. And I went back to my room and I cried, not because of what they said, but because I was so ashamed that I called myself a Christian as a young girl growing up. And I know I knew the Lord, but for somebody to think that of me, how can I be a reflection of Christ if believers, these girls who are no Christ, who are believers, say this about me and this is what they see about me? What does the world see about me? How am I a testimony for God? How, am I a, how is my life a testimony for Him? So that they say, they mean that they, people, when you meet them, you may be the only Bible they will ever see. And these thoughts were going through my head that night. And, um, I just cried out to the Lord. I, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. So we went to the conference the next day, and we listened to the preachers preach. And uh, under the preaching of Johnny Pope, Tim Lee, and Dave Reaver, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Dave Reaver. Anyway, he's a Vietnam vet, and all of these guys have served in Vietnam. Uh, Tim was a Marine, had his legs blown off, and uh, he was sharing his testimony. Dave Reaver was in an accident in Vietnam. He got hit by a magnesium bomb and his, his body was just destroyed. But these men loved the Lord, and they were solid. And uh, they were sharing, uh, they were preaching, and that night, the Lord convicted me so deeply that I started to cry. And I, I, I looked over at Rachel, and um, mind you, Rachel was at Moody Bible Institute at this time. She wasn't a young girl my age. She, she looked at me, she said, Roxanne, let's go pray. So I went forward and I rededicated my life to the Lord. And um, I said, okay, now what, what do I do? And so, well, you know, so I rededicated my life and I just gave my heart over to the Lord. I said, Lord, don't let me be a poor reflection of you anymore, Lord. Move in my heart, move in my life. Do whatever you needed to do. do. And, um, and so life went on and uh, went back home and Rachel's mother, Mrs. Gray, Mr. and Mrs. Gray are missionaries, and they ran the summer camp. And they hired me to be a camp assistant, and um, I loved working at Camp Loma de Vida. And uh, she said, 
she came up to me and she said, Mrs. Gray came up to me and she hugged me. She was such a good hugger. <laughs> and it meant so much to me for her to say, Roxanne, you've changed. And I said, no, I haven't. I haven't changed. Nothing's changed. And that's the beauty of the power of the Holy Spirit is that when that change happens, it's not because of anything that I did. It was because the Holy Spirit moved in my life and he was changing me from the inside out so much so that I was now becoming a reflection of and she could see that in me as, as a young woman. And so I became very close to Mrs. Gray and Rachel, and um, they pretty much discipled me and loved me through so many of the things that I've been through. And um, it was just encouraging to see that God's word is true. When he comes into your life, he will change you. He is after our hearts, and he wants to love us to life. And um, not but a year later, um, Nancy and I were talking about this, how she was talking about tent revivals. <laughs> how they always had tent revivals in the South. We always had tent revivals in the South, but in Texas, at our church, it was just too hot. We put up the tent and go back into the church <laughs> to have our revivals. But at the age of 15, a year later, we had a revival. We had a missionary come from Chicago. And this missionary um, was working with the Jewish people in Chicago. And um, so this is a week-long revival that we were having. and. Uh, of course, my parents made me go every night. And uh, even though I was like, God, I want to go, I still went. And, you know, I was honoring my parents. And uh, I, the night before the pastor was supposed to leave, we had a service that night. He was going to leave the next morning. Well, the night before he preached, I had a dream. And this dream changed my life forever. And I, I, I don't put a lot of weight into prophetic dreams, but this one was personal. This one was for me. I had a dream that I was left behind. And even though I knew Christ, I felt like I was left, I, I was left behind and I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my mother's credit card, I bought the ticket to Israel, and I started putting blankets, food, and Bibles in the caves because one thing I knew is that if I was left behind, I was gonna die <laughs> eventually, but I also knew that I would be able to help the Jewish people during the tribulation because I know that they would be, be living through it. And we're dealing with eschatology, I mean, Revelation, the book of Revelation. And um, and sure enough, while I, in my dream, while I was putting Bibles and blankets into the into the caves, this man came up to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm putting blankets and food here for you guys because the Bible says that you're going to run to the caves when, when the Antichrist comes to power. And he's, he was asking me these questions, and I shared the gospel with him. He was just a kid. But I shared the gospel with this man in my dream, and he got saved. And he went out and led the 144,000 to Christ. I'm 15 years old, and I'm having this dream. <laughs> and, um, and I woke up, and I realized, you know what, Lord? I may not be part of the, the, the 144,000 or, or have any part of this dream, but what I do know, Lord, is that you've given me love for Israel and for the Jewish people. And this pastor is working with Jewish people. So I went up and I dedicated my life to the ministry at 15. And so life went on, graduated from high school. And um, I was just really growing in the Lord and learning and studying and um, um, really diving into the Word of God. And one month before I graduated, I won the title of Miss Edinburgh. And then I thought to myself, Lord, how are you going to use this in my life? And I said, whatever you do, whatever capacity that you put me in, I want to, to glorify, glorify you, Lord. And so um, I competed in, in preliminary pageants to Miss Texas, Miss America. And um, I had a platform, and my talent, I was singing Via Dolorosa. <laughs> and so, so in little ways, I was sharing my testimony, and I also just wanted, I shared my experiences with people that I came across um, and it gave me a platform, but not only that, it also helped me, um, even though I'm nervous now, I was still nervous, I was still nervous back then with all the public speaking that I did, I, I'm just a nervous public speaker. But what happened was, I knew that the Lord um, had a plan for my life. Three things, go to college, well, I was gonna go to Bob Jones to get my MRS degree, I was going to be a, miss a missionary in some capacity, and I wanted to have a life of adventure. And um, so I got to go to Israel with my sister for the first time when I was 21. 
And uh, when we lived in Ethiopia, uh, King Haile Selassie asked Israel to send over a general or somebody to come over to train his troops. So Israel sent over Colonel um, El Hanani. And he, uh, he had two daughters. And they attended the American Army base, and that's where she and my sister became best friends. And she lives in Israel and grew up in Israel. And so we got to live with her for two months in Israel. And I got to travel all over. And then I realized, wow, Lord, you know, this is, this is where I feel like you're calling me. And, um, and so it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to see what Israel was like and to travel. And I got to sleep on the sand dunes in the Sinai. I got to have tea with the Bedouins. You know, and it was just such a wonderful experience, and I'll never forget it. Um, but it was just the beginning of the adventure that the Lord had for me. And uh, so from there, I realized, you know, I want to serve. I want to be in ministry, but how? And this is how I got to Bible college. So I had to go to Russia to hear about Bible college. <laughs> So when I was in Russia, one of my teammates worked for Eastern University, and I told her that I had a heart for Israel and for Jewish people. And she said, well, there's a school that trains missionaries for that. And I said, really, where? She said, in Deptford, New Jersey. And it's called the Friends of Israel. And so she goes, you know, when I get home, I'm going to have them send you a packet. And, I, and so that she, as soon as I got home, I opened that packet, and it was like the Shekinah of glory. <laughs> I was like, like whoa. It just, it just, it just rang true to me that this is, this is where I need to be. And um, I had talked about the Institute of Jewish Studies, and that's when I knew that this is where I need to go to this school. It was still in Deptford at the time, um, but when I applied for the job, I applied to go to the school, and it was just a one-year Bible program. And the president of the of the school, um, Will Barner. He was a Bob Jones grad, so I felt, oh, oh, of course, I gotta go, he's a Bob Jones grad. I, mind you, I had four brothers, a sister, and myself. We attended Bob Jones, of course I didn't last. But uh, I finally ended up going to IJS, Institute of Jewish Studies. And then from there, I transferred to Philadelphia College of Bible, which is now Cairn University. And um, I graduated with a one-year degree um, in Jewish Studies. And then I went on to get my bachelor's um, in Biblical Studies. And it was, I didn't know where, where I was going to go. I applied to Friends of Israel and Deptford at the headquarters. I didn't get the job. But the director of the Institute of Jewish Studies called me up and said, Roxanne, you don't want to go to Friends of Israel. It's boring over there. Come, come be my secretary at the, at the school, at the university. And I said, OK. So I ended up being there for 10 years. <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful experience because not only did I get to serve in a ministry or a paraministry, but I also got to meet students and invest in them. And um, I got to go to Israel every year because it was part of the curriculum. We had we took tours to Israel every year. We took our students there every year, except for the years they were fighting, which was okay with me because I had been there so many times before. So we did what's called Paul's Journey. So I got to go to Turkey. I got to go to Greece. I got to go to Rome. I got to study about um, the history of our faith and to stand in the place where in, in Israel, they talk about like the Via Dolorosa, they talk about these, these sites that you see in Israel, but there are only a few places where Jesus actually was. And those were the places that were so dear to me, like the steps of ascension up to the Temple Mount. You can stand there and sit there on the steps and know that Jesus walked up these stairs. You can walk and walk around and, and get on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and you know that Jesus walked on this water. He was real, and it's, it's so amazing to see how when you go to these places, that they're not just stories. These, um, your, your faith becomes real, the Bible becomes real. The sun, it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz. So it's all in black and white. And then when she lands in Oz, it's all color. And that's what it's like when you go to Israel. You get to see the colors come through when you're reading the scripture. So, so that was quite the adventure, you know, go to Russia and end up in Jersey. And, uh, and then a few years later, I met my husband. And uh, that's David in the back. And he's, he's had the opportunity to go to Israel with me several, four times now, he says four times. And, uh, but our first time we went to Israel, he was so 
apprehensive about going. Now, he's a mathematician. And so he said, you know what, Roxanne, let me do the statistical research on what, it, what would happen if I went to Israel. Will I get hurt or will I not get hurt? And I said, David, it's safe. And he goes, let me do the math, Roxanne. Leave the math to me. <laughs> so, so he did the research and he realized he's more likely to win the lottery or get hit by lightning than to get hurt in Israel. So he came with me. And it was on that trip that um, I realized, you know, this man is the man that God has for me. I fell in love and hurt 18 years later. And so, uh, so we, we got married. Uh, then we've been traveling for about 10 years up and down the East Coast with his job. He became the headmaster of school in Baltimore, Massachusetts, and then in Maine. And then the opportunity for me to um, come back to Friends of Israel opened up. And now um, we were in Maine at the time, and they, a job opened up said, you know, the president of the, of the ministry is looking for an assistant. So I applied, and I got the job, and so we moved back home. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just good because David's family lives in Philly, and, so, and this is where we met. So it was, it's good to be back. But all this was possible because the Lord cares about our dreams and the power of a praying mother. And she was always praying for me, interceding for me, because she knew the desires of my heart, and she also knew that she wanted me to be used by the Lord. Oh, also, shameless plug, there's, if you want his or my glory, you can sign up in the back. There's stickers back there, and there's also extra cards, but you can get your own copy of the magazine as well. So, now we're going to go into the topics of qualities and teaching of a godly woman. Proverbs 6, 20 through 22. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I need to keep in mind about what it means to be a godly woman, it also means we things to avoid. Um, here's, here's, I'm just going to read what, I, what was on my heart when I wrote this. I wrote, Satan, the father of lies, wants to destroy the institution of marriage, the family unit, and our churches. He wants to destroy your walk and your marriages and turn your daughters into OnlyFans, <coughs> TikTok, and Instagram collateral damaged goods, only to be pitied by those on the whatever podcast as they boldly admit to the body counts that will destroy their value and their self-worth. This is why it's important to establish a biblical worldview, seek his face, and love your precious daughters to life. A mother's relationship with the Lord will reflect in her relationship with her daughter. Don't get me wrong. Ultimately, we each are accountable, have to give an account for our walk. But when God-fearing example is set, it can have eternal ramifications. It can create sacred ties to each other and to that which is lovely and is good. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is where does it begin? Um, what are some of the qualities of a godly woman? Somebody, uh, what, what would you consider, Nancy, the quality of a godly woman? Being faithful to Jesus first. And then Somebody else? Good. Caring. Caring. Loving. Loving. Yes. These are all wonderful, wonderful um, examples of qualities of a godly woman. And it reminds me also of the qualities that I refer to are the qualities that I saw in my mother. I haven't shared a lot about my mom. Uh, when she was growing up, we, she grew up in South Texas and uh, very, um, very abusive home. She worked in the cotton fields in South Texas. Yeah. And her father put her to work right away in the fields. She was out there picking cotton. And uh, she was eight or nine years old. And uh, we grew up very poor. We grew, she grew up very poor. And, but one thing that my grandfather realized about my mother was that she was very good with numbers. And so he was able to take her out of the cotton fields and put her on the books. And so she was in charge of counting. My father was a coyote. Do you know what a coyote is? A coyote? What they do is they bring Mexicans from Mexico over to the state to work in the fields. And so he used to bring them over. And so um, she would keep track of who they were, what they were, how much cotton they picked. She was, she was handling all the numbers at 10 years old. She was a brilliant woman, my mother. Um, 
But as she was growing up, she, she wanted to get out of the house, and so she thought, I'm going to become a nun. <laughs> and so, until she met my father, and that all changed. <laughs> and uh, eight kids later, uh, a Catholic woman. Uh, <laughs> but she, she exhibited so many qualities of a godly woman. She was very strong, she was intelligent, and she was kind, and very loving, like her father said. But she also knew that the family was the primary unit of discipleship. So she got saved when she got older, after marrying and having several kids. My father was actually Baptist, she was Catholic. But she came to know the Lord later on in her life. And um, we asked her, she was such a loving mother, and asked her, Mom, where did you learn how to love like this? Because you didn't grow up with it. She said, well, I learned it from reading. I read books, I read the Bible, and I read several, you know, Several things, I don't remember exactly what book she read. I know one of her favorite books was called, um, Pearl Les Buck, uh, was called Good Earth, was the name of her favorite book. Um, so she learned how to love from reading. Um, and so she was a very strong woman. So when she came to Christ, she was very on fire for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, she learned that the family was a primary unit of discipleship. We emphasize the family unit as the primary context where faith is nurtured and passed down from one generation to the, the next. A mother's play is a central role in this process. The role of mothers in passing out God's truth to their children is seen as a profound spiritual responsibility. Now we look at that Proverbs 60.22. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart. Always tie them around your neck. And it's like a pearl, beautiful pearl necklace that's precious. And um, in the Bible, pearls are considered truth and knowledge and wisdom, something that's precious. And uh, Titus 2 talks about, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, and to be busy at home, and to be kind. Um, and that was always an important um, note that my mother used to say, Roxanne, be kind. Never pray for patience. Never pray for patience. Always pray for love. And so, because patience comes by trial and, and uh, tribulation. And uh, she was a very wise woman. And she only had a high school degree. <laughs> high school education. Um, Deuteronomy 6, the command to teach. Now God has called us to all be learners, to be uh, Bereans, and to dive and to really learn about the Word of God. And the book of Deuteronomy instructs the parents, especially mothers, to diligently teach God's commandments, statutes, and ways to their children. This is seen as a core biblical mandate. Now I don't know if you know Deuteronomy 6, it's called the Shema, and uh, it's Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, and uh, it's such a beautiful uh, verse, and every Jewish person knows this. They are taught from when they're little kids. It's sort of like us learning John three sixteen. <laughs> they know the Shema when they're little, uh, and the verse goes on, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto the children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and thou liest down, and thou risest up. So it's important to have the word of God in our hearts and our minds so that we can live it out. Now we come to this next verse that's really profound to me. Now all of us know about the virtuous woman. <laughs> we all want to be the Proverbs 31 woman. And so uh, the portrait of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 highlights the importance of a mother's wisdom, moral instruction, and nurturing of her household in the ways of the Lord. Now when I was a teenager, my brother, Roland, who went to Bob Jones, he said, he called up, the, he called one night, and he said, Roxanne, because you want to find yourself a good husband? I said, yeah, of course I'm being home, but I'm just a teenager. Um, he says, memorize Proverbs 31. And so that will give you a nice foundation of the kind of woman that you want to be, because these are um, the kind of men that you want to attract. You want to have those qualities already. 
And if you want to ha have a man with, with integrity, you need to have integrity. If you want to have a man who's kind, you need to be kind. And, um, and so Proverbs 31 is the perfect verse that describes a virtuous woman. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to read it for you really quickly. Um, 10 through 31. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that she shall have, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant ship that bringeth her food from afar. She riseth while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hand she plants the vineyard. She girds her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her candle goes not out by night. She lays her hands to the spindle and her and her hands hold the distaff. She stretched out her hands to the poor, yet she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry and her clothing are silken and purple. Her husband is known at the gates when he sitteth with the elders of the land, and she maketh fine linens to sell it, and delivereth girdles, and strength and honor are her clothing. She goes on, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. Her children will rise up and call her blessed, and her husband prays for her also. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Now this is so very contra contrary to the secular world, to what the world perceives as what is beautiful. It is all physical. It is, um, I think of, like the Kardashians. Beautiful women on the outside, but their hearts are dark. And, um, and so, there's nothing more beautiful than a woman who fears and loves the Lord. And, uh, and I encourage you to open up Proverbs. Now, there's 31, so you can read one every day. And, um, and it's one thing to remember, like, uh, there's two characters in the book of Proverbs. There's a woman of folly, and there's the virtuous woman, and, or the wise woman. And I think that when we read Proverbs, we need to keep that in mind. Because um, the, the virtuous woman is the wise woman. And uh, I don't know how to, how to put this in the We as women, we have this beautiful, beautiful gift of femininity. And it's a very powerful gift. We can use it for good, and we can use it for evil. And the Lord has blessed us with this, and I think we need to be careful about, about how we use it because um, we need to be sensitive, especially in this culture of sexual mm. deviancy, that what we leave in our wake is something beautiful, not something that's been destroyed. Um, so read, read Proverbs 31 through 30, and one day read a proverb every day, and it'll, it'll just really have a huge impact in your life. Reading and praying. Now, reading and praying is important. Uh, it will help you help be a better wife and a mother. It will have an impact on all that you do and who you are. From the way you handle yourself, to the way you dress, to the way you work. It's God's goal for every mother to be godly, not perfect, but her life is to be rooted in the word and prayer. Um, mothers have a special calling to lift up their children in fervent intercessory prayer and asking God to work in their lives. A mother who prays and reads the word of God may not, may not be able to do it every day. We're not perfect, but it should be part of, um, part of our walk. A mother who prays and reads the word of God um, is, is one that is really truly seeking a relationship with Christ. An important aspect of intercessory prayer is that above all, she believes the word of God and understands that it's not just a love note, but it's also a book of instructions. It is a guidebook to a growing faith that helps her rest in the truth of who God is and that he is faithful to answer prayer. It may not always be what we want to hear. It may not be yes. It'll be yes, no, or wait. And um, But he cares about our hearts, and he cares about um, what's happening in our lives. And so, but we can always get our answers from him. And I want to tell you a story about a, a, a rice cooker that my friend shared with me. 
is a prime example of the most powerful reflections of what Jesus Christ demonstrated for us. The ultimate sacrificial love that, his, that he paid on the cross, lying, laying down his life to redeem humanity. This selfless, unconditional, and sacrificial love is the model that Christians are called to emulate in their relationships and responsibilities. We demonstrate love through actions, words, attitudes within the family. The call for mothers to exemplify Christ's sacrificial love is rooted in biblical principles and teachings. The memory of my mom, my mom's unconditional love for the Lord and her sacrificial love for me is her legacy. And as I stand here as a mere trophy of God's grace, I can stand here and say that I was a recipient of God's unconditional love through the gentle touch of my mother's hand when I had a fever, the kiss on my forehead as I went to sleep at night, the tears she shed for me when my heart was broken, the night she spent in quiet prayer and worship when the rest of the house slept, and <coughs> not soon be forgotten. You see, my mom had diabetes. She was on dialysis for seven years. She lost her sight, she, and her body was just crumbling around her sharp mind. She would go to dialysis in the morning and sleep all afternoon. Now, we didn't have her in her bedroom because that would put her away. We had her in the living room so that she could hear our voices, hear our footsteps, be a part of the family even though she was asleep. We knew the importance of the subconscious mind and the ministry of her soul even though she was asleep. All afternoon she would sleep. So she was awake all night, in the dark, alone. And in the quiet of the night, I could hear her singing her favorite hymns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. I could hear it echo in the house at night. Her other favorite song was, My Jesus, I Love Thee. On Mother's Day 2009, on Mother's Day 2009, she went home to be with the Lord 17 years ago, or 15 years ago, yesterday. So in her honor, I'd like to sing her favorite song, she, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
seem that in the quiet of the night. So in conclusion, in closing, I am my mother's daughter. <laughs> this is the poem that's on the back of your card. But in conclusion, we must remember that the mother-daughter relationship is a sacred and special bond. In closing, for you young ladies that are here, show me your friends, and I will show you your future. 1 Corinthians 5, 15-33. We are defined by our choices, and those choices have consequences, but bad choices have victims. Remember Proverbs 31, memorize it, for this is what you should strive to want to be like. Forget the satanic worshipers like Beyonce, Kardashians, and Taylor Swift. They are so out of sync with the word of God says. Look to God's plan, because it is better than any plan with a combination of both true beauty and brains. You're probably asking, what am I doing here? My mother brought me here, or someone brought me and dragged me here. You're here because somebody loved you enough, too much to, to let you miss out on the message that God has for you. He's waiting for you to embrace the incredible destiny he has planned for you. Lean in and trust him and go all in. It's not easy, but I promise you it is the best decision you will ever make. And it will totally and radically change your life for the better. Listen up. God wants to meet you here and now. He wants to change your life from the inside out because that is what he specializes in. Let us embrace humility and simplicity. Let us be women who are open, who open their Bibles and read it and delve into its wisdom. It has the power to transform our souls. What's your legacy going to be? I'm so encouraged to see all of you here. Women, at the end of our lives, I pray that and hope that what is said about us is that, one, we read our Bible more than the news, that we build local churches rather than followers, that we, are trust, that we trust God more than we try to control our own lives, that we are on our knees more than we are on social media. That the next generation needs us, not 10,000 Instagram followers, or a podcast, or a TikTok video, <coughs> but you and me, a real person, a real connection. We must, must remember that the mother-daughter relationship is a sacred, special bond, one that reflects the very heart of our relationship with God. Just as a daughter looks to her mother for guidance, nature, nurture, and unconditional love, so too do we, God's children look to our Heavenly Father. And just as a mother's love for her daughter is selfless and sacrificial, marrying the love that Christ has shown us, so too must our love for one another embody that same Christ-like spirit. For it is through the care and spiritual mentorship of our mothers and the honor and respect we show them that we learn to walk humbly before our God. So let us cherish these precious sacred ties celebrating the unique and irreplaceable role that mothers and godly women play in our lives. May we strive to reflect the same maternal love, guidance, and spiritual nurturing in our relationships with one another, both male and female, with the dignity and honor that befits the Creator in the image of God. This is the calling that Christ has placed upon our hearts. May we have the courage and the conviction to faithfully answer the call. Amen.